So I'm going to start to draw in the sheep uh, with a couple of little lambs. I'm using a mid-blue watercolour marker for this. I'm using the, the fine nib. These particular markers come with both a brush nib and a fine nib. And the reference photo I'm using, because I you know, just took the photos of these animals from you know, quite a distance away, um, you know, it's pretty much out of focus really, but I'm hoping to be able to use that to my advantage and kind of create something which isn't too fussy in terms of detail. I may well put a little bit of detail in at the end, but um, the idea is to, when we get to the painting stage, the idea is just to block in the main shapes of light and dark. So one of the things I uh, enjoy painting when I paint animals is you know, less commonly seen poses. So I would say, you know, of the paintings I've seen of sheep, they're typically seen walking around and grazing, um, which is obviously something they do very commonly. And I've certainly created some paintings like that. But um, it's also fun to just, you know, like this early morning scene, they're just appear to be sort of chilling out together. Um, maybe they've only just woken up. Uh, so it's just a little bit different to have these three animals um, just lying on the ground. And I want to place uh, another little lamb here. So one of the other things I do when I'm creating a composition of animals is I try not to make them too well posed because I kind of think, you know, when they're out in the field, they're not standing still typically. And even if they're lying down like they are now, you know, they're not consciously deciding to sit in a in a particular composition which is going to suit me so with that in mind I try to make it look as if you know we've perhaps just kind of stumbled onto this scene so you know some animals are off to the side of frame um, on occasions I've had animals kind of half disappearing off the edge of the frame as well you know so um, I think it's just a little bit more of a natural approach to creating a picture Now, one of the techniques I use when I'm doing a drawing as the, you know, the first step on the way to creating a painting is I will put in the initial drawing that you can see in blue here with, you know, very little measurement, just kind of do it completely freehand and try and judge everything just simply by eye. And then having done that, I'll switch to a different color. So I've switched to kind of an, or an orange here. And I'll go back round my first set of lines, making corrections where I feel appropriate. Um, and for me, this has two advantages. One, it's reasonably efficient. And two, I kind of think, or my hope is, that what I'm doing by doing the first set of marks freehand is I'm gr continually training my observation skills to be able to make accurate drawings with minimal measurement. And that if you can get to the stage where that's that's happening, it really speeds things up. 
and you can be more expressive with your mark making. You can kind of just uh, let things flow across the paper rather than having to be too laboured and too considered about it. I mean, obviously, there is definitely a place for careful measurement, you know, without without a doubt, especially if we're painting animals and even more so if we're doing portraits. So that little lamb wasn't too far out. So now we go over to the adult sheep and once again using the orange watercolour marker I can go over my first set of marks in blue and make little corrections and little adjustments here and there. And one of the things you can also do with the, with the watercolour marker, I'm using the, the brush tip on this one, is, you know, you can just block in regions of dark tone if you want to. So, for example, on this particular animal, the front of the, the nose and the, uh, the face of the animal, it's all pretty dark apart from that white patch. And of course, when I, I'm going to paint, uh, create this painting in, in acrylic, um, so we'll switch to painting in acrylic in a bit. And the acrylic will just go straight over this watercolour marker, you know, with no problem at all. So, so the watercolour markers, I think, are a really adapt, uh, you know, flexible and, and uh, easy to use way of putting in the initial drawing so that if you want to have a complete absence of any of your drawing lines in the finished painting, then the watercolour marker is going to let you do that without any problem. Now the side of the chest here needs to come out to the right a little bit more. And the height of the head is about the same as the, the height of the chest roughly, so that's not too far out. And we come back here. I think I've made this ear a little bit too big, perhaps. Um, but the, the line of the neck isn't too bad. Now, one of the challenges when you've got an animal with a fleece like this, when it's lying down, is it tends to lose a lot of the structure of its body. And you want to, you know, as best we can, we don't want it to just look like a, a mass of structureless wool. So you've got to try and pick out and perhaps slightly enhance those angles and pointy bits and any little creases there are in the flesh where you've got like the bend of a leg. That's all going to help create the illusion of three dimensions. And then this little lamb on the left here. So we've got the ear there. The shape of the head's not too bad. Got a dark area where the eye is. And then the nose is pretty dark as well. Dark area here. I think that's mostly shadow, though. And then the front legs coming out there. There's a little bit of shadow there. And I think I made the back a little bit too high up and a little bit too long, perhaps. So I'm just going to truncate the length of the body. So I'm ready to paint now with my interactive acrylics. We've got cadmium yellow deep, alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, tinting white and some burnt umber. So the first thing I want to do is create an environment that these animals are occupying. And while I'm not going to try to mimic the exact landscape, I want to create something of that same atmosphere. So to begin with, 
we've got this um, you know wonderful sort of bright morning sky so I'm going to begin to put in a mix of nearly all tinting white with a little bit of the ultramarine blue and let me just uh, let's put a little bit of water onto the paper with the spray bottle and I've, I've got this I don't know, don't know what it is one inch what, one and a half inch maybe two inch decorators brush and I'm just going to begin to put a bit of that pale blue down onto the top of the paper here and to be honest that color is way too dark so I'm going to grab a bit more white and we'll mix that in to lighten things up a little bit so let's see if we can lighten up the sky somewhat so that's starting to work but let's get a bit more white in there So I'm just laying on pure tinting white at the moment. And that's not too bad. Next, I want to begin to suggest some of the distant tree lined hills. So I'm dipping back into that darker blue that I started off with. I'm going to add just the merest touch of um, the burnt umber and just the merest touch of the crimson I've got there, the alizarin and a bit more of the blue. Again, not very much at all really. Um, we'll see how this looks when I put it onto the painting. I'm going to keep the surface of the paper fairly moist. I want some soft edges between the bank of colour I'm about to put down and the sky. Uh, that's not too bad. That's starting to work okay. So notice how I'm moving the brush sort of against the bristles to create um, some nice texture and a sort of feathered, soft feathered edge. And then we'll, we'll continue that down a little bit lower over here on the right and you know, perhaps even come up to come up to the edge of this main animal here, the larger animal over on the left. For the next bank of trees that's a little bit closer to us, we want to take a bit more of the blue and mix that into what is left over of the colour I've just used. Take a little bit more of the burnt umber. And again, we'll see what that looks like when we put it down onto the painting. So again, I'm going to keep the paint nice and moist so that with these interactives that allows you to continue to blend. And we'll see what that looks like. And again, that seems to be okay. So just suggesting the outline of some trees here, which are in front of that most distant bank. And then as we go over to the left hand side, let's add a little bit more blue, not too much, just a touch, just so that we're varying the colour that we're putting down. So if you look at a landscape, you know, it's not going to be one uniform colour from right to left. OK, so now we've got our second bank of trees. Just realise that I can actually just I need to fill that little bit in there a bit and we'll come up a little more tidily to the edge of the animal. 
Now I could do a third bank of trees, but I think, to be honest, I think that's probably going to be enough for the very distant background. Having put in the very distant background, now I want to create uh, a hedge line with some trees which are going to form the distant boundary of the field that these animals are in. So I've still got that blue on my palette, but I'm going to add a little bit of uh, the cadmium yellow deep that I had and a bit of a uh, bit more of the ultramarine blue. Again, let's grab a little bit of water in the palette and spray the surface of the painting. And what I'm going to do now is begin to put this on. So this is obviously a darker colour. And we'll just tap that across from right to left. And vary the height of the hedge as well, because uh, the hedges in Devon, uh, they're often hundreds of years old, actually. And, uh, you know, they contain a huge array of, of wildlife. Um, but they're certainly not regular in shape. Okay, so that's the beginnings of some kind of highlight colour for the hedge, because I'm going to darken that hedge quite dramatically in a bit. In addition to that green I just put down, though, I want to make things a little more orangey, perhaps an orangey brown. So I'm just, I've just grabbed some um, of the Cad Yellow Deep I just mix that into the green that uh, I put down a second ago. And let's take just a little bit of the alizarin crimson and we'll mix that in. And again, we'll see what that looks like when I pop it down onto the onto the painting. And again, that's not too bad, not too bad. So keeping things very, very loose. And that's probably probably enough of that for the moment. And having done the lighter areas, now I can begin to create some darker shadows. So I actually squeezed out way more burnt umber than I actually intended. So we'll try to use some of that up now. So I'm mixing some of that into that kind of orangey brown I had. I'm going to put a little more uh, of the ultramarine blue in. But I haven't mixed that too thoroughly, so on the left side of my brush I've got a more bluey mix than on the right side. And I'm going to use that now to hopefully put in some darker shadows uh, for this hedge. And because I've got two colours on my brush, I'm going to get some automatic mixing and blending and variation in colour as I put the brush down onto the surface of the paper at different angles. So that can be a really efficient way of, of working. Kind of let the brush do the mixing for you rather than, you know, get too involved with doing everything on the palette. And again, we'll uh, put a little bit of a shadow over here. And now I've just picked up a, uh, a liner brush or a rigger and um, I'm just going to drag that through that colour that I was just using. And what we'll do is, you know, I'm not going to go too wild here, but uh, we can just go wet in wet and um, put a few, you know, there are some trees in the actual reference, but I don't think I'm going to include those in any great uh, uh, amount. But, you know, we can just put a few little bits growing out of the hedgerow. Again, you don't want to be too precise about it, just to just hint at it. Well, we've established a bit of a background now and yeah, you know, the colours are cool, they're pale and they're neutral. So now we've got to start to work on the foreground. So we want to go a little bit warmer and a little bit bolder. 
So I've just grabbed some of the cadmium yellow deep and I've mixed that into that very, very pale blue that I used for the sky. So let's begin to use some of that for the distant part of the field. OK, so I'm going to begin by using a fairly similar style of paint application that I used earlier for the uh, for the trees and the hedgerow. But then I'm going to sweep horizontally across there as we come down the painting. So we're just beginning to establish a little bit of warmth and a different surface for the field compared to the hedgerow. But by putting the paint on in the, uh, the original way, I've, I've cr automatically created a few grass bits of grass growing up in front of that darker hedgerow. Now in my reference, the hedgerow is actually much taller than the sheep. You know, it's, um, it's not that far away, frankly. I've made it much smaller because I want the sheep, this main animal, to stand out against the pale background. However, to avoid this animal looking like it's a, you know, well, all of them, in fact, we don't want them to look like giant sheep, although, you know, I do do surreal paintings once in a while. Um, what I'm going to do is keep this pale colour for the distant part of the field. And, and I'm going to come in now with a much warmer um, green for the foreground. And I'm going to paint that in such a way that it looks as though perhaps these animals are kind of just on the top of a hillock. And so that the uh, the hedgerow could be pushed off much further into the distance so that, you know, it's going to hopefully give the impression that our vantage point is quite low rather than uh, quite high up. So that's, I'm hoping, going to make the, uh, the animals look a little more in proportion with their surroundings. So I have grabbed some cadmium yellow light. Just had the cadmium yellow deep before, if you remember. And I'm mixing that in with some of the very pale blue that I had before, but I'm going to pick up just a little touch of the ultramarine blue and we'll see what that looks like, like I've been doing all the way along. We'll see what it looks like when we put it down next to the other colours on the painting. So here we go. Let's uh, let's scumble in some of that. And I'm going to pick up a little bit of white, but not mix it on my brush so I can get some automatic mixing on the paper again. And then as I come down towards the front of the painting, just going to pick up some more of the yellow, putting a little bit more of the ultramarine blue in. So we're just going to vary the greens that we've got. And yeah, this uh, rough and, and you know very much used decorating brush, it really is wonderful when you're using fluid paint for automatically creating a uh, little more ultramarine blue going into the mix. Interesting textures. You know, it's uh, it's a bit like painting with watercolour in the sense that if you let it do its own thing, although I'm using acrylic, if you let uh, the brush do its own thing, then you, you, know, you often get something which is more interesting than if you actually tried to do it in a certain way. OK, so we've got the first layer of paint of our landscape in place. Next, we need to work on the animals. So the first thing I'm going to do is switch to a little filbert brush and pick up some pure ultramarine blue. And this is going to be my first approximation to some of the darkest colours in the painting. So I used that orange watercolour marker before to put in some dark regions. But now I'm going to replace that orange 
with the ultra marine blue. Um, and as I said, this is just a first approximation, but I quite like a little bit of pure blue, little bursts of pure blue showing through in some of the uh, darkest shadow regions. But I will be adding some other colours to these shadows in a little bit, so... But the main thing I'm doing here really is putting in a dark tone and then that's going to allow me to see how the painting's working as a whole and whether I need to make any you know, further adjustments. So that's the, the dark, darkest area of that main animal gun, or the, the adult. If we move over to this little lamb on the left, we can see that the ear is very, very dark. And the nose is very dark as well. And uh, the eye is also fairly dark. It's also a little patch up here of darkness, which I've just included as a, well, didn't think about it too much. I don't know that I needed to include that, but uh, let's not be concerned about that for the moment. And then over to the animal on the right, and we'll pop a line of shadow in there for the ear little indication of the eye and then the nose here is also dark and there are other shadows of course but they're not quite as dark as the ones I've put in. Having put those really dark areas in I'm now switching to half inch flat brush. I've still got this ultramarine blue here that I used just a moment ago but now I'm going to go in and pick up a little bit of that burnt umber mix that I use for the hedgerows and mix some of that in. And then I'm going to mix in some of the white I've got left over here as well. Probably could do with grabbing some more white. Um, so, but we'll see how it goes with this colour. So that's not too bad, I don't think. So what we'll do is um, add a bit of water to both the painting and the palette with the spray. And then what I'm going to do is squint at my reference and I'm going to tr just look at the big dark areas and keep in mind the general direction in which the, the surface of the animal is curving. Now obviously, um, you know, sheep's wool has a multitude of textures, um, you know, across the whole body, but at this kind of distance and with this particular style of painting. I don't need to be overly concerned with any of that, certainly not at this stage in proceedings anyway. So really what we're doing is, it, the other way to look at this is you could say, well, where are the brightest areas? Leave those untouched for the moment and fill in everything else. That's more or less what I'm doing. So So for that reason, I'm going to leave a little burst of uncoated paper along the top of the back there. And, you know, but we will fill in the rest of the body below that. And again, this is just the first kind of shadow layer. So we will be adding other colours and darker tones and possibly even lighter tones within within the shadow layer. But again, you can see I'm moving the brush in kind of a scumbling back and forth fashion. Um, and I was chatting and not thinking there, and I went all the way up to my orange line, um, uh, which I shouldn't have done. And I've also realized I've missed, uh, missed off a little bit of green there, but we, we can fix that later. So it's nothing, nothing to be overly worried about. But, uh, for this lamb on the left, we can darken most of it, most of its silhouette, but again, leaving little bursts of light coming through because we've got this wonderful sort of spring morning light beaming in from behind the animals. So they're kind of backlit. So this lamb on the right hand side, it's got a little halo of light on the left edge of its silhouette. It's a bit of light catching the top of its head bit of light sort of pouring down there, making an inverted 
almost an inverted V. Uh, and that's probably enough for the moment. But while I've got this color on the brush, let's put a little bit more blue into the mix and mix it into the green that we had. And we'll also put just a little touch of the alizarin into that as well. And what we can do is uh, just put a little dusting, dusting, little misting of water um, onto the painting. And then I can use this dark kind of darker shadowy green to begin to put some shadows into parts of the field or around the animals where there's a little cast shadow. There are some longer tufts of grass here, perhaps. So it's gonna, that's going to help, I hope, create the illusion that the light's coming from behind. So I've mixed up a new shadow color from Burnt Umber, Ultramarine Blue, and a little bit of the Alizarin Crimson, and a little bit of the Tinting White as well. And I'm just using my flat half inch brush to um, introduce some darker shadows within the, the kind of blocked in blue region of shadow that we've got so far. Now I did let the painting dry completely um, since I last applied some paint. So that's why I'm kind of spraying the, the surface of the painting with water. So we'll continue the shadow area over to the where the rear leg is kind of um, curled up. Or... So I've deliberately made this shadow a little more to the purple than the, the first shadow I had down, uh, which, as I just mentioned, is, was kind of bluey. And then we can continue with this colour onto this little lamb here as well. And I can use the same colour on top of that ultra marine blue that I put down. And that's going to considerably darken those areas and bring them closer to uh, a black. Even though I don't want a pure, pure black, you know, it's going to get get them kind of right into that very dark shadow region. Now I need to do some little bit of uh, cosmetic surgery on the head of this large animal here uh, at some point, but you know we'll get to that in, uh, in due course because I haven't quite got the, the shape right, I don't think. I think what happened is, uh, I don't think my drawing was too bad, but then I put a little bit of extra height into the um, top of the head without without really meaning to. So we can perhaps kind of compensate for that by making the head just a little bit wider over here. I think that's going to help a bit. I'm just going to drag this dark shadow out that way a little more. Uh, and that's looking a little better proportioned now. Then we can move over to the little guy on the uh, on the right here. Again, darken the region on the ear, put a little dark area in for approximately where the eye is, darken the nose, and then squinting at my reference, there's an area of dark shadow there. And down here as well. And this is where the frayed nature of this little flat brush, I think is really advantageous because, you know, it's pretty difficult to put down 
a completely uniform brush stroke with this uh, brush in its current state, which is a good thing because, you know, the surface of a lamb or a sheep's uh, fleece is obviously textured. So it's a nice way to create some texture automatically without having to labor over it too, too much. All right, well, now that I've done that, can we use the same shadow color anywhere else? So, you know, we can use that darkening of the shadow technique on some of these little uh, stumps of grass in the, in the field, because when I overlay the, the reddish shadow color onto the kind of green shadow color I've got, that's going to create a nice deep shadow. So it's all helping, I hope, to create the illusion that the light is coming from behind these animals. And then the shadows um, on the ground. With the animals kind of bedded down into the into the grass as well, they could be considerably darker too. Now everything's really quite dark and cold at the moment in terms of colour scheme, so let's grab some cadmium yellow deep and we'll take that and add a little bit of the alizarin crimson and uh, that might be a little too vibrant we'll um we'll see how how that goes on Oh, that's not too bad. So I'm just going to use this to introduce a little bit of warmth into the fleece, um, in particular where the kind of lighter blue shadow ends and we're starting to get into the very bright highlights along the upper part of the back. Now, um, I don't want to use just one highlight colour everywhere, but um, while I've got this on the brush, I will you know, use, use it wherever I can, basically. Try to be as efficient as possible so that I don't have to keep uh, going back and remixing something close to the same colour. I think I can use some of that on the on the horns here. And then we'll see if we can carry on with that colour scheme a little bit for the animal. On the right hand side, put up perhaps put a little bit there. On the head, a little bit on the ear. Um, and that's probably enough of that exact colour. So let's let's mix things up just a little bit by putting a bit more of the alizarin in. And um, we'll see if we can introduce a little bit of colour into the main animal. So I think I can just put a little bit of red there. And that's probably enough, I think. So next I'm coming in with my filbert brush and I've mixed up a pale blue with um, a lot of the tinting white and a, li a little bit of the ultramarine blue. And I'm going to use this, as you can see, I'm beginning to block in 
some of the highlight areas. So, so this is giving me an giving me an off white, basically. I don't want these areas to be too bright everywhere, at least not at this stage. And then a little bit later, what I'll do is um, I will, you know, put in some little areas of very, very bright highlight in on top. Now there are some areas where the orange watercolour marker is still showing and I'm deliberately leaving some of those because um, I'm hoping they'll add a little something to uh, the final painting. But you know there are definitely areas where I want to cover them pretty much. Now my particular um, f reference is so dark that I can't really see what's going on around the mouth of the, the big animal here. So what I'll do is I'll look at a slightly different reference in a moment um, and just get, you know, uh, a little better view of the of a sheep's mouth in order to approximate what would be going on. And again, we'll move over to the, the animal on the right of the painting. I nearly forgot actually there's there's quite a line of highlight down the right hand edge of the chest just here and while I've got that blue mixed up I'm actually going to um, just spray the paint, that little patch of paint I've got left with, with water. Go back to my one inch flat brush. And actually let's get it even more, even more fluid than, uh, than I had it. And I'm actually going to use this to just gently lay in some slightly lighter areas in the, in the shadowy regions of the main animal to begin with. So as I do this, if I do this gently enough, it should just lighten just ever such a little bit some of the, the dark shadows. But the work I've done already should, you know, show through. Now, when, when you're doing this, you have to kind of have a little bit of faith because um, you can't really, really tell exactly what it's going to look like until the paint is completely dry. So it's a little bit of um, trial and error.
up until now I've been using tinting white, which is uh, a little more translucent than the very opaque titanium white, which I've now got on my brush. So this is going to allow me to put on little areas within the subdued highlights that I put down a moment ago. Little areas that are, you know, very, very bright. And, you know, we'll see what things look like in a bit. But I suspect what I'm going to have to do in a little while is darken some of the colours next to this animal to make those highlights as, appear as bright as I need them to be. But what I'm definitely not doing here, if you notice, is I'm not just filling in that whole outline with white because that tends to make the animal look a little bit too cut out, you know, as if it's been cut out of cardboard and stuck onto the, onto the background. Um, so because, you know, sheep's wool, it's got lots of clumps and, um, oh, I've, I've managed to get a bit of uh, a lizard and crimson into the mix. So I, let me just clean my brush and put some fresh paint on the palette. On second thoughts, I've decided to uh, carry on with that because a, a little little burst of a lizard and crimson in the highlight might be um, quite interesting. So we'll see we'll see how well it works. Um, yes, yeah, so because the the texture of the sheep's wool, you know, it's it's pretty random and got lots of lumps and bumps in it. You know, you want the highlight that you put down to reflect that fact. So it's going to be somewhat disjointed. It's not going to be all one colour. And it's certainly not going to be a, a single continuous line of, of one thickness. So you've always got sort of, you know, four or five different parameters to play with, um, almost regardless of what you're painting. Um, and the, if you just vary those gently, it, it gen as you paint, it generally makes for a more realistic and interesting image. And I think part of the problem that we often have as beginners is that the language we use to describe things by, you know, by design, really, is very concise and it's very effective. You know, what color is a sheep's is sheep's wool? It's white. You know, that's true and it's very useful in the everyday world. But when we're trying to paint something which looks like sheep's wool, then we have to sort of go beyond that initial rather uh, simplified description and, uh, you know, realize that there are lots of different colors you know, due to the way the light's interacting with the wall. Not not to mention the fact that obviously these animals are out in a field and uh, may well be muddy. So the little little animal on the right always seems to get left to last. So I managed to put a bit too much uh, white on there, so. Had to lift a bit away. And having done the highlights, now I just want to add uh, a few very dark areas. So just grabbing some of the burnt umber and a little bit of the ultramarine blue. And so there's quite a lot of shadow 
just here at the base of the head of this little guy and um, I want to just remove that bit of orange kind of just change the angle of the the jaw as well of this main animal and then I'll put a little bit of darkness next to the highlight at the bottom of the animal as well And often in a sheep's uh, fleece, there are just little, little areas which are very dark because they, you know, they picked up a bit of dirt or something. So definitely not something I want to go overboard with, but um, doesn't mean we can't include it. Then I'll use just a couple of touches of that same colour on the front of this lamb's uh, nose and mouth. A little bit of darkness on for the eye. And in the ear as well. And that's probably enough there. So at the moment I'm thinking I may leave the two lambs pretty much as they are. Just grabbed a little round brush, going back in with the tinting white and some of that pale blue I mixed up earlier. And i um, just going to add a little bit more of a refinement to, uh, to this main, main sheep here. So in particular I want to put some colour in. on the tops of the ears and then you know a little bit here as well to suggest there's an eye underneath the brow so it's a little bit of artistic license going on here just to sort of break up as I said my reference as you can see on screen um, it's not uh, there's not very much detail so having to use a little bit of imagination make things look a little better than they are and then uh, let's grab a little bit oh, oh I need to clean my brush a moment and having done that I'm coming in with a mix now of mostly titanium white and the cadmium yellow deep so I'm using this to Put a few highlights on the top edge of the horns here. And now that I've done that, I'm realizing that uh, that same color could work really nicely uh, on parts of the fleece. I'll put a little bit on top of the ear here and here as well. And just a few little bursts of warmth, I think. I'm going to help make the, uh, the highlights and the uh, colors in the fleece pop a little better than they currently are. And I can also use this. So for example, I kind of feel these little blocks of white are perhaps a little too uh, thick and, and featureless. So you can sort of go back into a highlight you painted earlier and um, 
you know, just break it up a little bit, add a little variety to proceedings. So, so the highlight on the rear end of this little lamb is warmer than the highlight across the back. So it's good to include that. And then I can put a little thin line of warm highlight along the edge of the back highlight. I'll put a little bit there on the back of the head as well. And I certainly need to brighten up some of these highlights with a second application of the um, titanium white in a bit. And I think I'll put some on the ear. So, as I say, I quite like the introduction of the warmth into the into the colours I've got going. So I've mixed up a, uh, a similar kind of combo of colours, but I've used more of the alizarin crimson. Actually, that's not true at all. Sorry, what I did was I took some of the cadmium yellow deep and a little bit of the alizarin crimson. I forgot that I hadn't used the crimson in the previous mix. So let's put just a little bit of that there. Little touch on the ear. And then we'll move back across to the left hand side of the painting. And again, you know, don't want to go too, too crazy here, but um, just adding in some little bits of this warm color. I'll put a little bit in for the eye there as well. I'll come back in and work into the detail of that in a bit. And then what I'll do next is take this same colour and put a little bit of the blue in. Maybe a touch more. And uh, we'll run some of that uh, along this horn. That's not dark enough, actually. Let's get a bit more blue in there. And then go back into the tinting white and lighten things up a little bit again. And just begin to uh, you know, remove some of that blue that I had for the um, for the mouth area. It's, you know, it's just a little too blue, and also along the top of the head here as well. So it is dark, but uh, you know, the pure blue is perhaps a bit too much. I now realise. And again, while I've got that on the brush, I can pop a couple of little bits of that colour into the fleece. Sticking with this small round brush, I'm just going to come back in with the pure titanium white again and put some smaller marks 
along the highlight of you know, that's going along the back, primarily to just break up some of that orange line that I've still got present there. And uh, similarly here, the, the highlight I put in before isn't quite, wasn't quite covering in the way I want it to. And on the back of this little lamb. Now we'll dip back into the pale blue, just lighten that area, and then go back into the slightly darker blue to just adjust that part of that lamb as well. And then I just want to, um, with a mixture of ultramarine blue and burnt umber, I just want to put some indication that, you know, the, the pupils of a, of a of a sheep, you know, they they've got that almost slit like appearance. So just give the the sheep an eye. And then that same colour, perhaps I'm just mixing it up afresh here, get it super dark. I can put in a little more um, just a little indication of the nostrils. On the mouth as well. And then I've taken that colour that I had on my brush and just mixed it in with a lot of the Cad Yellow Deep and um, some of the Ultramarine Blue. So I've just mixed up, a, you know, a fairly dark green. And I just want to use that to um, make sure I bring the dark background right up to the uh, up to the edge of the animal, basically. So there aren't any weird gaps which are you know distracting from the effect. And then I think the main thing that remains to do is just to block in some of the field a little more so that some of the initial drawing marks uh, are no longer visible. So I've picked up some of the uh, Cad Yellow Deep and mixed it in with um, some of the Ultramarine Blue. And, you know, I'm varying the amount of Cad Yellow I've got in the mix. And uh, just using that on, in, you know, on the foreground, just to kind of solidify the land that uh, uh, these things, these animals are sitting on. And I think that tone is more in keeping with the lighting conditions as well. Um, so, but I do quite like the bright green, so we're not going to lose that in completely, I don't think. <laughs> 